All right, welcome back. And uh, we have a few uh, newcomers, uh, well, new <laughs> people who joined after the first round of intro. Um, I think first on the list is Greg S. Would you like to just give a short intro, who you are, what's your nickname, and um, what do you do and what do you want to get from this Contributor Summit? Sure thing. Uh, so, uh, so my name is Greg Sutcliffe. Um, I go by Gengilvan. Uh, it's the weird-looking Celtic one uh, in IOC. Although I think Matrix has kicked me out. I need to go find out what's happened there and rejoin the channel. Um, but I'll be in a minute. Um, so yeah, my my name is Greg. I am the community data scientist. So I work with Gonzalo and, and Carol and and Greg Deck and Robin and try and like understand the data of our communities uh, around Ansible. Um, and help that to uh, to do better things. Um, so I'm going to show some of that data in a little bit. Uh, what do I want out of this? Uh, more talk about data, yes. Um, in particular, uh, I, as I said last time, um, I'm very interested to hear what maintainers want to know, um, what helps people um, get their work done, right? How can I build tools uh, that help the community get their work done? So if you've got any thoughts on that, I'm more than willing to, to, to have a chat uh, and to build tools with. Um, so that's me. Thanks, Greg. I think next we have Milan. Are you here? Would you like to give a short intro, Milan? Okay, if not. Feel free to intro yourself also in chat whenever. Nathaniel? Hey, uh, I'm Nate. Uh, I'm Kalthos in IRC that starts with a Q. Don't worry if you can't pronounce it or spell it. Um, I work on the Ansible networking team, and I'm here just to see what people are thinking about what we've been doing. Thanks, Nate. And uh, let's see, Japs, Andrea? I think Shops just popped out to grab uh, lunch. Okay, <laughs> all right, you have to wait for the next round then. <laughs> uh, anybody else I've missed that you have joined but have not done an intro yet? All right, then I think we can carry on with the agenda. Cool. Thank you, Carol. Um, yeah, so just before the break, we were talking a bit about the different collections that make up the new Ansible package. Um, so for the Ansible 2.10 release, um, which is in Alpha 2 at the moment, um, we're not extending the number of collections that we ship with. Um, I'll put the link of those back in the chat. Uh, oh yeah, there we go. Right, let's jump on the right link. Um, yeah, there was a bit of discussion about if for the first this first new release of the Ansible package, um, if we should open the gates and just include every new collection. We quickly decided that we've got enough work um, to do to make sure the framework and testing is good. Um, so we're only including collections that contain modules that were previously in the Ansible Develop branch. Um, so that's the thing that gives us the, the hopefully seamless upgrade from Ansible 2.9 to 2.10. Once the dust has settled on 2.10 and we're all happy, we'll start to think about um, the next release, which will probably be Ansible 2.11. Um, maybe after that will be 3.0. I'm not sure there's other stuff that needs deciding to, before then. Um, what we'd like to do for Ansible 2.11 is extend the collections that we'd, we'd ship. So we'd Want to allow extra collections to be included in the new package. So when someone does pip install or yum install Lansible 2.11, they'll get much more. Um, 
we haven't talked much about what the entry criteria or requirements would be for that. Um, I'd be interested in knowing different thoughts. Um, heads up Tosho and Greg and Robin. I'm probably going to pick on you very shortly to think about uh, what the criteria could be. Part of it, I think, is around, it's a bit of a double-edged sword, right? We can have just you know, the equivalent of installing an operating system and you go full install and you get 70,000 RPMs of which you, you don't know or care about most of them. Um, but on the flip side, it, it is a nicer experience if, you know, rather than having to get people to individually install individual um, collections on top of Ansible. Um, some things we've talked about in terms of um, requirements is that Ansible tests sanity. So if you've ever raised the PR against the Ansible Ansible repositories, um, that's what gets well, one of the things that gets run. One of the useful things that that does is make sure that the documentation blocks are valid. So that's just the YAML strings that we pull out on top of modules and plugins to generate the documentation. Um, the things like password fields have got no logs, so we're not leaking passwords to the screens. Um, what I'd like to do now is for, to sort of open the floor and get people's views on if they, they think we should just allow those in new modules or what type of things we, uh, what the criteria should be for that. Um, Tosho, if you've got any thoughts, I'd welcome them. No, I don't have a lot of thoughts on this. Yeah, and I know you've been focusing very much on getting 2.10 out the door and 2.11 as right. well in the future. Yeah. We can go... I can see as... That's right. We can go with a very low bar. Things like the automated sanity test, do they pass? Okay. Um, or we can go for a much higher, but anytime we start going away from things that can be automated, then we start getting into, do we have the manpower to actually look at this? And I think that's a little bit dangerous. It's one of the problems that in Ansible Core, we, we tried to go for a high bar we didn't have the the manpower to you know to review everything and and see that the quality had been met and then merge it in so i don't know how many volunteers we'll have who want to enforce a high bar if we have you know 50 60 100 people who all say hey we want to have a high bar on this collection um then uh -huh to do that but if we only have like one or two people per collection then that's probably not something that we can do um greg here uh so uh, uh covid uh allowing at some point, we will be expanding the community team at least a little. And from my perspective, one of the most important functions of that expansion is to help us uh, onboard new contributors and help figure out how to set this bar appropriately for collections in the community namespace. My hope is that this position also helps coordinate volunteers to help in this process. And so we, we've got a, a process in Fedora, and many of us who are working on this project have experience in Fedora. And in Fedora, we've got the concept of a proven packager, who is uh, you know, someone who knows how to make a good Fedora package has proven their ability to make and maintain content. And my hope is that we move towards a similar process uh, in Ansible. 
I, I know that the analogs aren't perfect, uh, but I think the general idea is is a sound one. So that's my hope about the direction that we go. Uh, and we'll see how long it takes us to get there and if, if there's any if there's agreement that that's the right direction or if we have better proposals on the table. Yeah, and I see in IRC um, Berlin guys saying that there are different sets of criteria for collections that are certified. So that's part of the the commercial the downstream to so the Ansible um, automation platform. Um, I think would pick at least um, a subset, if not the full set of the automated requirements that we can put in that. Um, Felix asks, he wonders how long it will take for the new Ansible package to be a gig inside. Well, I, it's not that big at the moment. Um, I think it's around, I don't know, a few tens of megs maybe, because um, it's all Python, so it compresses pretty well, and well, text doesn't take much space anyway. Uh, Tosho, could you put a link in to the in IRC for the um, uh, Ansible build data that was used for 2.10 Alpha 2 that actually contains the precise versions of the collections that were included? I can't remember which of the files that is. Thanks. Does anyone have any concerns about? Um, opening up the opening up the criteria a lot more and including a lot more packages. Maybe, maybe I should do polls on RC. Maybe that's easier. Let me do that. One thing that I'm wondering about is uh, licensing. Core, we allowed only GPL v3 modules and plugins. Module utils are the only thing that were allowed to be something else, which was just generally more lenient. Um, I'm wondering if we're going to continue that or if we're going to open it up and allow, you know, modules that are Apache 2 and so on and so forth. Yeah, we, it's on us to get clearer policy here. Uh, there's nothing, so the, the comparison we've been making here from a sort of policy perspective as we've been thinking through this is that Ansible is moving more from a single project model to a distribution model. And a distribution like, you know, uh, any Linux distribution can have uh, content that is licensed in different ways. So that now opens up the possibility for us to have multiple licenses contained in what gets shipped in Ansible. So we will loosen that policy to some degree. To what degree is unclear. The biggest problem that we have right now is that there are people who are moving their content that was in Ansible into separate collections and then trying to relicense that content. And this is a thing that we are going to discourage slash prohibit because we have no way of knowing if the person moving the content actually has the standing to change the license. And, and the, the reason for that is that in order to change the license of content from GPL to something else, you must have the permission of everyone who has contributed to that content. And we have no way of verifying easily whether 
uh, the person moving the content has the permission of everyone involved to change the licensing of that content. So the TLDR version of that is, if the content was in Ansible and it was GPL, it will remain GPL and new content uh, may have new licensing. We still have to work out the details of that before we start adding new content into uh, uh, Ansible. Yeah, and we've already seen some cases of this. There was um, a new collection created uh, by the company that had put some content into Ansible 2.8 and, and updated it in 2.9 and just taken it and relicensed it as, sorry, changed all the copyright headers of every file to, from GPL v3 plus to Apache. Um, but they haven't contacted all of the people that previously contributed to those files, so we've had to like go. Uh, don't think that's doing. Don't think you can do that. Go talk to your legal team. Um, we, we probably need some clearer wording on on that stuff as well. Um, we'll make a note of that. So um, I put a little poll in IRC, uh, so if people want to vote, vote on that, that would be uh, good. Um, I realise I didn't define what massive means. Um, so, so the question was, should Ansible 2.11 be allowed to uh, massively expand in terms of number of collections? Plus one for yes, minus one for no. Uh, Greg, yes, we do need to clarify the, the policy a lot. I'm just trying to get a, a base bit of feel of from the wider community on what they think. Um, I, I see people are talking about what's strategically important. Maybe that should be included, um, which I think is totally makes sense. My sort of concern or the challenge with that is um, that's very subjective. Um, It's well, one thing we struggled with in the Ansible Ansible repository was saying we appreciate that you've taken the time to raise this pull request, but it doesn't fit and then close it. We give people the, the false hope, misplaced hope of maybe someone will raise, uh, review my PR and merge it rather than someone going, this doesn't fit with what we're trying to do, close it. Um, so I think that's something that we'd need to be a lot better at. Uh, if anyone wants to jump on audio so people aren't just don't listen to me all the time, that's also cool. We love your voice. It's, it's soothing. Pretty calm, isn't it, Greg? Don't answer that. I, I guess I could ask instead of on IRC. Um, the idea of removing stuff from Ansible in the past, there was a deprecation cycle and, and things like that. But one challenge I think we might have is that the, now that there's a lot of collections that are massive, like community.general, there's things inside of it that were slated to be deprecated. And is the idea that they'll be removed from the collection and then in a future Ansible release, it'll be removed, removed from that version of Ansible. And also for collections themselves, if a collection goes unmaintained for a couple of years, is there yet any uh, any idea of how we'll like take that collection out or deprecate it?
Uh, That's right, Con. This is Greg. Uh, I, I've been wrestling with uh, the difference between orphaning and deprecation for a while. I think that deprecation is something that should be reserved only for cases where there's a clear uh, reason to actually get rid of it, i.e., uh, a, a module has been replaced by a new module uh, that basically takes over the functionality and the old one should no longer be expected to work, and that needs to have one cycle. But for content that is just old or may not be working or something like that, uh, that content can always be picked back up if it, uh, if, if someone uh, wants to. Um, and there's plenty of content that is still useful, but isn't necessarily changing, doesn't necessarily need to be updated, and so may appear quote unquote dead, but is still actually useful. So there's a, we, I think we need to have mechanisms to flag that content as potentially unmaintained. Uh, but any removal cycle for such content should err on the side of being very long, I think. And, and uh, as a parallel to that, uh, it's been sitting on my brain for a while to actually come up with the proposal for the orphaning process, uh, by which I mean someone has decided no longer to maintain a, a piece of content, or it has become obvious that they are no longer around and are not maintaining that piece of content. We need mechanisms to list that content, make it clear when people look for the docs for that content or maybe even use that content that it doesn't have an active maintainer and have some mechanism to recruit maintainers uh, for that content. Uh, broadly, you know, in, in Fedora, we call that the orphaning process and having some similar process is a, is a high priority for me for when we get through 210. And I guess regarding uh, a potentially easier, a simpler case of where um, content has been, there's still an active maintainer, but there's a better module to use. We've already put some uh, deprecation notices in. Um, and Felix, feel free to jump on to correct me. Um, but for example, we said this thing will go away in uh, Community General 3.0.0 or 2.0.0, um, depending on when that's due to be removed. And that works pretty similar to the, so when you run Ansible, you get a deprecation warning once, and then you've, you've still got some time to update your playbooks. That's correct. Hey, Felix. Oh, I'm not sure whether that came through. I said just, well, sounds correct. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Jeff, so with that, any further questions, clarifications needed? I'm not sure we covered all your points there. No, I, I think it's some, something that'll probably take a couple of releases to start figuring it out. Thank you. Cool, yeah, so I, I think what we'll maybe do, um, so as I said um, earlier, but for the benefit of those just joined since, um, we'll, we're going to have a bit of a hackathon on Tuesday, Wednesday, so that'll just be on ILC. We won't have blue jeans running. Um, the reason for that is 
there'll be different things going on and we appreciate that people also have day jobs. Um, so just having the IRC in the corner of the room hopefully makes that a bit easier, um, especially for, for people where English is their second language, um, which there's a lot in this room, which is great. Um, uh, and I think maybe this is something we'll try and discuss a bit more and we'll set up a, a neat pad so, uh, like we've got for the channel. Um, any other questions on any of the process contributor side of things? Um, if not, we'll, we'll hand over to Greg Sutcliffe, who's going to talk about the, the data and behind a lot of this and how we've uh, tried to make informed, informed decisions. Uh, and you, but yeah, if not, um, feel free to keep discussions going in IRC. Um, and I'll hand over to Mr. Sutcliffe. Thank you. Hello, hello. How are we all doing? So, yes. Um, right. This is somewhat ad hoc, uh, and it might feel a little disjointed. So, what I'm trying to do is something that follows on from what I talked about in the country summit in March, but is also accessible to people who weren't there in March. So if it's slightly repetitive and boring for people who were there in March, I apologize. And if it doesn't make sense to the people who weren't there in March, tell me and I'll go back and clarify. Um, but hopefully the, the, the goal has not changed, right? So to, to, to repeat from, from that talk, um, part of my job is to help Gondolo and Carol and Greg Deck and everyone um, to, to, to maintain things. Uh, and my focus is on collections as well, along with everybody else. And from my perspective, my goal is to understand um, what's happening there at a statistical level so we can decide if we need to take action, right? So this is things like how is our contribution level, what's our backlog look like, things like this. Uh, and I showed a few things then, and I'm going to show them again now to show how that has changed. Um, and, and then I'm going to dive a little deeper into a couple of topics. So let me show you, firstly, uh, let me screen, I've got a variety of screen shares to go. Uh, it's, it's dealing with a lot of data. Yeah, um, his uh, browser just crashed, so he'll be back uh, momentarily. Right. So apparently, I shouldn't say the word crash because it did. <laughs> um, and I'm, and am I, am I called twice now. What's going on there? Like. I swear Chromium crashed completely. Oh, no, I've gone again. Oh, I don't know. Technology, right? If it worked, we wouldn't have jobs. So let me try that again. And if it crashes again, I'm going to do this whole talk without screen sharing, which is going to be super interesting. <laughs> I guess... I think we lost him again. <laughs> I wonder if there's uh, something. Do you have a URL that I can share or somebody can share on your behalf? I did have similar behavior with um, Microsoft Teams the other day and Chrome. Mm. Maybe switching the browser makes sense, Firefox. Yeah, let's see if he's getting back on. Greg, can you hear us? If you try a different browser, press Firefox. So I will um, just ad lib a little bit here, I guess. Um, I know people. there's a lot of new faces here today that have not been here before, which I think is brilliant. Um, what I'd like to know is how, how did you hear about the Contributor Summit? Um, feel free to just type in the Blue Jeans chat or in IRC. So for those of you that are, are new to this is your first Contributor Summit, how did you find out about this?
Hello, am I back? Hi. Hey, there we go. All <laughs> right, let's switch to Firefox and see if that works better, shall we? Oh my goodness. <sighs> right, let's try that again, and I will try very hard not to disappear for a third time. And uh, I hate Mondays. <laughs> we did this on Sunday, in March, right? So that that'll be why. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> let's let's get let's try this again. Uh, oh, now Firefox isn't going to let me screen share. Lovely. Um, yes, I know I want to click allow to start sharing my screen. You haven't actually shown me any kind of pop-up to enable it. Joyous. Right, we'll do this without. I will put links in chat, and you can all go and have a look at them, at least to start with. Here's a, chat. Here's a link. Um, now, I looked. If you were to go back, I was going to show you the... Oh, my. I want to, I want to share screens, and you won't let me. Why not share screen? I really want to be able to share the screen with you, and it really, really does not want to let me do it. And I can't work out why it won't let me, because it should. It's got permissions. It is not my day, is it? Would it help if I share it, and you just let me know if you want me to page out? Well, some of, it's, some of it's on my screen. Some of it's on my, my RStudio session. That's the problem. I really wanted to share that over, and I really... The thing is, I'd test it and let Gundlow talk for a bit, but obviously if I start testing screen sharing and stuff, it's going to interfere with the call, right? Um, so it's like, ah, oh, for goodness sake. Um, I'm going to reload one more time. I do apologize for messing you all around. Um, and if it doesn't work, then um, I'm going to just talk for a bit and tell you what's going on. All right, for those who just joined, feel free to ask your questions in chat. We are also on Freenode IRC channel Ansible dash community. Uh, I will drop the links to the web chat and Etherpad so you can follow along. No, it does not want to let me screen share. I cannot make it work. Fine, I'll just have to talk, and maybe I'll put some screenshots or something in chat or something like that, I don't know. Um, I apologize for that, um, it's really annoying. So what I was gonna show you was a bunch of really nice graphs. Um, and I will I will put links to the current sort of um, public versions of these in, in chat just now. Um, Craig, feel free to, me, yeah? do you want me to screen share start, start, end? And... Yeah, if you could screen share those two links. There's more I wanted to show, um, but I can talk through it and, and just explain what you would be seeing. Uh, so let's start with this one. I showed this graph uh, in March, and if you go back and look at the um, YouTube video from March, you'll see um, a comparison. I had I had the timestamp and everything set up in my browser here, uh, but I can't show it to you. Um, so all I wanted to say here, so, so the goal of this graph, if you've not seen it before, um, is to try and have a look at the sort of momentum that's happening within the community. Uh, we knew that moving away from Ansible, Ansible, uh, we would lose people. Um, you know, the the additional process needed to move everything out into their own repos. The, the collections would potentially lose contributors, uh, and so we were um, worried uh, about that. And we wanted to track that, uh, and so we decided to to set this up. Uh, so this just measures how many uh, unique contributors uh, each collection has seen uh, over time, and in the header for each of the small panels. Uh, you will see the number of historical contributors that Ansible Ansible saw uh, over the course of, sort of 2018, 2019, um, so that we've got something to compare it to. So we've got an idea of, of where we're down to. Um, and what's notable, here we are three months uh, later than the last time I showed this graph. Um, what's notable is that last time it was in the sort of 60%, the, the y-axis was only going up to about 60%. I think the highest was Grafana at about 62-ish, something like that. Um, and now we're, we're well over 75. If you look at the top of that, some of those have hit 80, 80 plus. I think Grafana's on like 13 out of 15, if you hit that top right-hand dot there. Um, I was looking at it earlier. Um, so this is good. We're still getting more people in. If you go to the second tab, the new collections, some, some collections don't have equivalent historical values, Community General being the obvious example, but there are others. Um, so if you can click the new collections tab there, Gundlow, thank you. Um, just just look at look at Community General. I just love that graph. That's just meteoric, right? It's, it's such a rise. It continues to grow. It continues to attract new collaborators. 
that's good to see. Um, we're, that, 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 that's nice. Um, and this is not the only metric that's important. Uh, people will be quick to point out that, you know, someone raising one PR and, and never being seen again isn't, you know, as as much as, as we like. We love those people, but we also love the people that stick around as well, right? Both of these things are important. However, it's nice to see that it's not just dead. So, so this is good, uh, and we'll continue to keep an eye on this. Um, and we uh, we're we're not too. It's not it's not really an actionable metric exactly. It's not the sort of thing that you could um, build a policy around, right? It's not the sort of thing you can say this graph isn't going in the direction we like. What are we going to do about it? You know, there's no clear actions that come from it. But it's nice to track. It's nice to look at. It's your, your classic kind of up and to the right kind of dashboard. So that's nice to see. However, I want to focus a bit more on on a different type of metric today. Um, in my last talk in March, I showed a graph uh, and I made the point that one thing we really care about is the backlog, right? Um, we really care um, that uh, it doesn't get out of hand again. Uh, we don't want to have to do this again, right? Um, and we have more tools than we had then. Um, you know, having collections all split out means we can move things around a bit more easily if things aren't quite where we think they should be. But still, it's upheaval that we'd rather avoid. And so we want to keep an eye on the backlog and take action early. Um, and so what I've been doing, uh, and so at the time I posed the question, um, can we say statistically uh, that the backlog change, the change is important, looking at it from the point of view of the daily change is important because that means it can be positive and negative, which makes the statistics much easier. If you think about the backlog change daily or weekly or monthly or however you want to look at it, um, you you can think of that as a normal curve, right? A, a bell curve, Gaussian distribution, um, which will ideally be centered on zero <laughs> or very close to it. Um, and with long tails, it can go as negative or as positive as we like. We will have days where we mass close a whole bunch of issues and there'll be a, a, an entry at minus 30, right? Um, and so if, if we can do that, uh, and I think it's realistic to do that, um, the only thing that would that would really prevent us doing that uh, is if there's uh, what we call autocorrelation. That's when um, the amount of PRs that are opened or closed yesterday affects the amount of PRs that are open or closed today. And I don't think it does. Um, I, I just don't. I don't think that's a, a valid um, uh, problem, right? I think I don't think there should be any correlation between the two. So, um, so it, on that assumption, we can then start looking at this um, in, in a slightly different way. Um, this, what you're, what you're seeing here, and I have it plotted in front of me as well, as a, this is weekly, what you're seeing on Gundalo's screen there. Um, I've got it daily here. It's a similar picture. Um, this is the change in the backlog day on day. Now, it starts from zero, and it will continue to start from zero forever, even when the backlog isn't actually zero, because it makes the calculations much, much easier. Who's still on? <laughs> Gundalo got his mic open. Um, so, oh, someone has anyway. Um, so, the idea here is that we, we look at a period of time, this is six months, it will always start from zero, even if the backlog six months ago is not zero. It just make, I, I don't want to have to construct the whole backlog from zero every single time, because you have to look at the whole history of the repo and it's time consuming and I don't want to do it. So, this is the change over six months, it starts from zero, and as you can see, Community General is less than six months old. And so we have a very steep rise initially as we get everything set up and lots of things are opened and things are migrated. But already we're starting to see some evidence of it leveling off, right? Now this is the, the total backlog. This is not the backlog change. This is the, the cumulative. This is this is the actual backlog. And if you go and look at the backlog of um, of Community General today, it's it's, it's around 60 PRs. Um, so this is starting to look nice, right? It's starting to flatten out, and that's what we want to see. We want to see it flatten out. Clearly, it can't be negative for a sustained period of time. You'd run out of PRs, right? <laughs> but um, but we'd like it to be as close to zero as we can. But we but the real question, as a statistician, from my perspective, is how confident am I that that is close to zero? And that's what the second tab is for. Could you change the second tab, Gundal? Thank you. Um, so. So this here is um, the same data, but now we take out that time axis. I said we could treat this as a distribution. This is what the distribution actually looks like. So for every week, in your case, I'm looking at it daily on my screen, but it's the same idea. Um, every uh, time period, we just, we just look at the number of PRs that were open and closed, subtract one from the other, we've got a number, we do a histogram of that, right? Um, and so we do a nice little histogram, uh, and we can plot it, and we can ask some questions of it. 
And the most important question is how close is that mean to zero? So as you can see at the moment, Community General has a mean of 3.6 PRs per week net uh, increase in the backlog. So we would expect the, the backlog to go up by 3.6 PRs every week at the moment. Um, but there's some uncertainty here. We're sampling, right? And we don't have a large number of samples. This is only three months worth of data now. And the reason I've picked three months is because we want to be able to react quickly. Um, I don't want to be, us to be waiting a year to find out there's a problem, right? So we pick just a short amount of data. That only gives you 12 data points, right? Um, three months. So that's not a very big sample. And so we have some uncertainty. And if you look in the top of the title bar, just underneath where it says three months, there is a confidence interval. Um, and that confidence interval is 0.03 to 7.14. So we think that the mean number of PRs added to the backlog per week is between pretty much zero and seven. That's quite uncertain at the moment. You can look at this daily as well. I've got the daily one here. Um, and the daily one actually paints a slightly different picture. It's somewhere between um, minus 0.14 and one um, per day. So that works out about the same. One per day, seven per week, same idea. Um, so why is this interesting? Well, if zero is in that confidence interval, which for the one you're looking at, it isn't quite, um, then we think that statistically um, there is a difference, that the, the mean here is not zero, right? That's that's what we're saying, to, to, to some degree of confidence, 95% in this case. Um, and that means we need to go and take action, that the backlog is growing, and if, un, if left unchecked, may continue to grow until we get back to where we get to Ansible, Ansible, and it's all horrible. And that's the point of this graph, is to be able for us to say, from a statistical point of view, the backlog is going out of control, go and do something about it. Right. Um, that's what, what we really care about. Uh, and right now it's very close to zero. And I'm not too concerned because we've still got that ramp up phase when Community General is getting all its stuff migrated over. If this continues to be statistically above zero into the next sort of month to two months, then I'm going to be coming back to Gundalo and Greg Deck and saying this doesn't look good. Right. Uh, and that, that perhaps we need either to think about what's going into Community General or I don't know what actions we might take out of that. That's not really my choice right <laughs> but um but it would be for me to say look statistically this doesn't look like what we're looking for um and that that's 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 kind of cool it's nice that we're able to say that now what's interesting at the moment is um this data that you're seeing is from last week i've updated to this week's data and already it looks slightly better um so i do think things are calming down um i'm just going to i'm just going to rebuild it weekly so i've got the same thing that you're seeing uh, let me recompile. Um, so this this data updates daily, uh, no weekly. Um, so you'll be able to come and check this URL if you wanted to make a note of it and see what's going on. I, I don't try and hide anything. Um, there are other tabs here as well that we could talk about potentially, um, but uh, they are well. We could. We'll see if we've got time. Yeah. So I've just I've just refreshed it for this week's data. Um, and zero is now inside the confidence interval just. It's now minus 0 0.04 to 6.66 is our confidence interval. Uh, and that's really nice to see. Zero inside that confidence interval tells me that we're close to zero. We might expect the backlog to grow a bit, not very fast. Um, and that it's something we can act on. So this is good. Um, now, it's interesting because you can do the exact same thing for the, all the collections. Right? I index quite a lot of collections um, uh, about well, 20 or so. It's not the same list that you saw in that first graph of sort of contributor progress. That comes directly from Git URLs, which doesn't necessarily have to be on GitHub. Um, so the list that goes into my um, data that I can get pull request information for um, is a smaller list of collections. But still, there's a fair number. Uh, I'll just I'll just check. Let me just see here. Um, follow repo name. Right to unique. Uh, like to enroll. Hmm, that didn't work. <laughs> oh, okay. Type to length. It's not a table. There we go. Yeah, 62, 62 collections. Uh, I've got data on uh, here for, for, at a pull request level, and we can ask the same question, right? We can do the same graph, and I wish I could show it to you because uh, I've got it right here. Um, but if we look at all collections, not just Community General, Community General is special because it's got all the stuff in it that doesn't have a home in other places, right? And we need to keep a careful eye on that because it's not got the same level of kind of like a single collection for a single issue with a dedicated set of maintainers. It's a very clear cut set of like, where are the edges, what's going on, right? And I feel like Community General, we just need to keep a closer eye on it. 
um, because you've got that kind of mishmash of stuff going on in there. And yes, there are some very well-defined teams within it, but still, we want to watch it carefully. I did the same process, that same distribution graph with the mean. Uh, could you go back to that one, Gonzo? That'd be great. Um, yeah, that one. I did this same graph for, um, for all collections, and actually, it's a much better picture. For collections as a whole, uh, the confidence interval is between minus a half to 2.3. Um, so much closer to zero, and much more confidently uh, able to say that, yeah, the, 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 that it's fine, that it's not out of control, which is really, really nice. But you can actually go further, and you can ask yourself which which collections contribute to it not being exactly zero, which ones are strongly positive, right? Um, and if you do that, um, then you can build a table, and right now it's only two. One of them is Community General, as you will not be surprised to learn from the previous graph, um, but the other one is Community.AWS, that also has a strongly positive mean at the moment. Um, which is unsurprising because actually Gundalo, Gundalo and I were talking about this last week, um, and it point. It, it, I can't remember Gundalo what the conclusion of our conversation was. I can't remember if it was that you knew that the bot was broken and you just hadn't done anything about it, or if, uh, or if my stats made you go look and you realised that it was broken. But either way, the fact that I built this table of means for PRs per week had raised an issue with AWS that reminded you that the, the, the bot wasn't pinging maintainers in that particular collection, right? So it's working. We're using stats, we're getting actionable items out of it, and we're keeping track of what's going on. And that makes me feel really, really good. Uh, how am I doing for time? Yeah, you've got a bit more. And yeah, the bot currently only works on community.general. Um, and as you said, because community general, community network, um, and, re and realistically, community AWS is sort of general purpose uh, collection, uh, repos and collections that is not just a case of any maintainer can act on behalf of any other and say, this looks good or I have enough understanding mm. that we need the the individual expertise there. So we need to make sure mm. the individual maintainers. But for the record, community network's doing quite well. It's got a mean of 0.13, um, and I think that might even be daily. <laughs> so let me. Uh, so that's that's pretty low. Um, and yeah, as a result, the the uh, confidence of all that is is pretty much squarely around zero. It's minus 0 0.2 to, to plus a half. Um, so they're doing really well. <laughs> uh, but but the point here is that it raised an issue, and that we realised now we need to go and, go and make sure that's working right. So that's 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 what I like about that. And that's my goal. That's what I I, I like doing is building tools for people that raise either things we can track or actionable items. Um, that's what I like to be able to build. I don't don't really like just building dashboards for dashboard's sake. Um, if they're not going somewhere, what's the point, right? Um, so if I've got a bit more time, we'll we'll go one more tab. Can you go into the survival curve tab? Sorry, which tab? I'm actually the one doing the tab. Oh, you're doing it, Carol. Sorry. And um, the the third tab, survival curves. So um. People who've seen me before will know this is one of my pet loves. Um, I hate means of things that shouldn't be taken a mean of, and time to merge is one of them. Um, so this is a look at time to merge in Community General uh, specifically. Again, I'm paying closer attention to Community General because I feel like that's the one where things can slip through the cracks. It's very, uh, I, I'm a fan of Douglas Adams, uh, and there is the classic somebody else's problem field. Uh, and I think Community General could suffer quite badly from the someone else's problem field if we're not careful. It's that here's a PR, who's dealing with it, right? When it's a single collection for a single issue, single type of thing, then then it's clear what's happening, but in Community General, maybe not. So I thought I'd track a couple of other statistics. One of them is how long it takes to close it. This is the time to close for PRs. By the way, if you swap the three letters PRS, PRs in the URL for issues, you'll also get exactly the same data set for issues, which obviously includes people raising queries and bugs and things without attached code. Um, so obviously there's a much higher number there. Um, I'm looking at PRs because I think that's more relevant to the Contributor Summit, but if you're interested in issues, you can uh, you can go and look at that. So this is the time to close for PRs, and I split it into two data sets. Um, the first is uh, what's happened in the last three months, and then um, everything else. And right now, that doesn't leave a lot. If you look at the table at the bottom, there's 328 PRs in the last three months, 104 in the time before that. That's because the repo hasn't existed for very long. Uh, and so, as a result, um, it's not a very fair comparison. You're, you're comparing the very old PRs from when we set Community General up, and think about what happens whenever you set up a new repo. Um, there are a ton of PRs that come from the maintainers, 
which are just testing things or setting up CI or all that kind of bots, etc. Um, so there's lots of PRs that tend to get opened and closed very quickly, uh, often without any kind of comments because they just opened it to see if CI would run and then they closed it again. Uh, so it's an unfair comparison at the moment, and, and unsurprisingly, now that Community General is actually up and running and doing some work, we see that the time to close is slower, the blue line is higher up uh, than the red line, uh, which you can see that a large number of PRs were closed very quickly indeed. And if we want to think about this in some terms of average, a median is the only thing that really makes sense, and I've put that in the table uh, in the top right-hand corner, so you can see that um, the median for old PRs was half a day to close. Whereas in the last three months, it's more than tripled uh, to 1.7 days. Um, that's expected, as we've discussed. Um, what we want to do is keep track on this. We'd expect, I'd hope, uh, to see those lines come back together. And ideally, we'd like to see the blue line get below the red line. Right? We'd like to know we're getting better. We are um, starting to track these numbers more specifically. So I'm going to log these medians uh, to a table. Uh, and then we can plot you know, direct trends of, uh, of what's happened to the median time to merge um, over a given period of time uh, in the future. But right now, we're just looking at the raw data, and, and it looks pretty reasonable. Um, I'm not so interested in the median. I think about 25% is really where it's interesting. So you know, that's like, what, about five days for the red line and more like 20 days for the blue line. Uh, for the record, the gray line is the total. It's kind of a reference curve. It's just what happens if you plot all the data. Uh, could you? Go, uh, Carol, to the second tab inside this one. So not not up there, but time to first comment. So I did the exact same thing for time to first comment, uh, which is what it sounds like. It's someone opens a PR. How long does it take for someone else to respond to it? So that filters out replies from the author themselves. You can't bump your own PRs, and it filters out um, bots as well, so ANSI bot and so on. Um, so when when do we get a reply from someone else on a PR? This is a bit more murky. Um, again. Um, we see the blue line is uh, higher up than the red line. It takes longer to get a comment on newer PRs than older ones. Again, that's expected. Set up PRs tend not to have a lot of comments on them. Um, so, or or it can be like the maintainer just you know fixing things and stuff. So not very surprising. Uh, again, we'll track this one. But if you're interested in how responsive our maintainers, then this is an interesting graph. Um, notice the numbers are much higher here. So even for the older PRs, it's nearly three days to get a comment, whereas currently it's over a week. Uh, which is um, not ideal, uh, but we'll, we'll hope to improve that. Um, I think that uh, that's most of what I wanted to talk about in terms of collections. I'm noting, um, I'm wondering if it was worth, if we've got time, is it worth me talking a bit about meetup stats? Do we want to do that? Yeah, sure. That could be interesting as well. Um, if people are not bored of my voice at this point. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> I think well, let me let me address a question in chat there because uh, I think if we publish these videos later, you don't get the chat right. So Baptiste um, asks if it's interesting to differentiate uh, core developers from less involved contributors. I think you're absolutely right. Um, so at the moment, I'm differentiating on time, right? You got the red and blue lines, um, and that doesn't make sense for long. It's much better to log these medians to a table and plot them separately, right? And then you can see what's happened over time and what the state of the repo was three months ago compared to now. Um, I'm only doing that because there's not a lot of other strata that make sense right now. But that is a good strata, right? So you could absolutely split these into two different lines, blue and red, uh, one for core developers and one for non-core developers. You, any, any kind of facet, any kind of subset that we can think of can be applied to these types of graphs. And you'll note there's a p-value in the top right, well, middle right there. Um, and that tells you whether or not there's a significant difference. So for this graph, for example, there is a significant difference. T typically, and I'm generalizing, statisticians will kill me. Um, but if you see a p-value of less than about 0 0.05, uh, then it's worth um, it's worth looking a bit closer. Is is the way I like to think of it. That the, some scientists, particularly ones who don't work in stats, will tell you that if you get below 0 0.05, you're good. Go publish your paper. Uh, but it's it, it's a little bit more nuanced than that. But um, but largely, the smaller the p-value, the more interesting this is. And if it's below yeah, 0.05-ish, then um, then you've got something different, right? And so here we're saying, yes, there is a difference between the blue and red lines. And so we can ask that question, right? We can go and facet this data on contributors of differing types or any other thing we can think of, 
um, and ask if there's a difference. So if people want to look at that and are prepared to work with me on like how we categorize that data, because for example, I will not know in your repo who are the core contributors and who are not. So I would need to partner with people who are interested in answering that question. Um, but I'm happy to work with the community and answer that kind of question. I think it's an interesting one. Um, so, good. Hopefully that answers your question. Um, let's talk about meetups. Do you want to go to the meetup dashboard, Carol? Yeah. Oh no, it's boomed. Oop. Logged in. Oh no. All right, live coding. Let's go. Uh, CD2 var log shiny. <laughs> Uh, let me have a quick look here at what is going on there. It's probably something trivial. I think I've got some permissions. There's, there's, there's some weirdness because, like, so I work in R, right? Um, and R released version 4.0 about a month ago. You can imagine what that's done to like all my apps, right? <laughs> that going from version 3 to version 4, like major, they, they, they follow the same like semantic versioning as everybody else. We're on 4.0.2 now. Um, and yeah, you can imagine that that has um, not. Uh, done any good? Oh, oh seven, oh six, thirteen. No, oh, I can't type today. Log. There we go. Let's cut that. What's happened? Yeah, it's a permission denied thing. Where? There. Okay, that's fine. I can fix that. There we go. Right, can you reload it? Well, it hasn't bombed instantly. <laughs> yeah, permissions issue. There we go. I need to fix that. You know, I heard there's this tool that's really good at like automating things in the background. Uh, <laughs> I should probably try using it. Um, so, right, meetups. I have shown this many moons ago. I don't think I showed it in the last Contributor Summit. Um, and honestly, it was like the first dashboard I built when I joined the team. So right now, right now I'm looking at it and my eyes are bleeding because uh, I really want to go and rebuild this, but I haven't got the time. <laughs> um, so I, I do this for Carol. I track statistics on all of the various meetups. Uh, there's more I want to do here, particularly in this COVID world we're in now. I want to start looking at like differences between virtual and, and non-virtual meetups, uh, if there are any at the moment. Um, but the idea here is that, that to, it's mostly to give Carol a whole bunch of tools, right? But I think, I think it might be interesting to talk about meetups and strategies for the community. Um, so I wanted to let you know this was here. Um, so if you run a meetup or you're interested in meetups, you can come and have a look at this. This is public. The URL's up there. Um, and could you click on a, a, a meetup or two? Oh, okay, you're going to go look at the graph. <laughs> um, just to show you what's going on. So the bar graph shows you RSVPs and how many events you've had. So color is RSVP, height is uh, number of events. If you click on a particular Meetup, it will show you. Oh, no, you actually clicked on the name, haven't you? <laughs> Don't click on the name, just click on the row. Oh, yeah, which I was supposed to, supposed to click. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I was showing it, if my browser would just behave, then I could show it myself, right? Ah, oh, okay. There you go. So, yeah, if you click a couple of them, you can do like comparisons between the uh, between the, the different meetups. So, you can look at Pune versus London. Um, yay, London's got more RSVPs, love it. Um, you get the idea. So, so you can get some basic stats on that. The table is searchable if you want to look for your local meetup. Um, so you can go and have a look at that. Um, stick the map up. The map's a good one. The other two tabs are less interesting, I think. But so the map's good. So, so the map here is specifically to try and um, to try and help decide where to put meetups. And that's an interesting problem in the current world, right? <laughs> because does it matter now? I don't know. Um, but the, the original goal was this. Um, the blue circles represent existing meetups. Radius uh, is related to the number of people in that meetup on meetup.com. Right? Whether that has any meaning in the real world, we can debate endlessly. Um, but um, so there we go. Um, and so we know where the meetups are. And so if you wanted to create a new meetup, this is a good thing to look at and say, where is there not one? Um, but not having a meetup there already is not and not, it's not enough. It's it's necessary but not sufficient, right? To use that classic phrase, because you need some people in your meetup who know what they're talking about. Um, otherwise, um, it's less good. Um, so the best way I could tackle that was to take some of the the data that I already have. In this case, the PRs data, like I already indexed a whole bunch of GitHub stuff, right? So I thought, well, why don't we go and get a bunch of contributors? Um, now, some people put locations in their uh, GitHub profiles, and to be fair, I I. I'm walking a gray line here. I care a lot about privacy and ethics. 
And so what I did was I was like, okay, I am going to take those fields and I am going to geolocate them, and then I'm going to strip it completely down to the country level. Um, so I hope I'm not offending anybody by doing that. Um, if I am, then let me know, and I'll I'll add you to an exception list. How about that? Um, but yeah, uh, the idea is that I, I go and look at um, all of the contributors. This was done for Ansible. Ansible, I need to redo it for collections now, um, but the idea is much the same. Um, and so you, you get a list of, of locations, basically, a list of PRs that came from a country. And it gives you at least some idea that there might be people in the area that, you know, gives you some idea of, like, where to site things from Carol's perspective, right? Um, so this is this is kind of hmm, semi-useful. Um, yeah, um, to answer the question in uh, in chat, um, D. Kirsten's asking if we, uh, if we have any kind of show, no show. I would love to have any data at all on who actually comes to meetups. Um, but you can't get any. The closest you can get from Meetup itself is the people who said yes on the RSVP. But unless an organizer actually like were to come and give us a list, like it, it, it's it's on the organizer basically. There's no way in Meetup for you to log that data, as far as I know. Um, and even if there is, I certainly can't see it uh, from my end uh, looking at their API. Uh, so the closest I can get is the yes RSVPs. Um, and so. I, I, we, we, we batted some ideas around for a while on how to, to get that data. It was my suggestion that we tie that together with swag. So when you're requesting new swag to give out at your meetups, you also have to tell us how many people showed up in the last couple of meetups. I thought that might not be a terrible price. <laughs> but um, yeah, um, it was tricky. I don't care about individual people. I don't want to, I don't want to end up scanning people and tracking people. Um, that feels wrong. Um, but just raw numbers, right? You know. 20 people signed up, 10 people came. That's interesting. Um, so yeah, if you've got any thoughts on how we can improve that or what you'd be prepared to put up with as a maintainer, like I, I run meetups and it isn't a great deal of fun standing at the back of the room counting heads while you're trying to listen to the talk. Uh, so, um, so I get it. But if you can help at all or you're interested in helping, um, please, please let me know because I'll happily make a space to store that data and to, to make it easy for you to input it somewhere. Uh, but yeah. Um, we don't have it at the moment. Anyway, um, so yeah, so that's that's what we have. There's also, um, if you're interested, the last tab that's worth looking at is the reports tab. The, the middle two there are old and don't really do much that's useful anymore. Um, but there, we do have a couple of reports. Um, so uh, Carol makes, I know, a lot of use of the upcoming events, um, but you might find that interesting as well. And so this is just what's coming up on Ansible um, that we know about. Um, and then there's also, if you're writing any kind of newsletter for whatever reason, so this was mostly done for Mark, and there's also the past events report as well, which is what's happened in the last couple of months. So, um, yeah, that's what I have. Um, yeah, to add to that, since nowadays we have a lot of virtual, most of, like, if you see the upcoming events, it's like webinar or, you know, some probably some of these are online events. Uh, feel free to add that to your meetup group. Like, for example, uh, last week we had, the India meetup, well, it's it's virtual. <laughs> it's probably like more related, to, more restricted in terms of time zones rather than geographical locations. But you know, most people in the same time zone in India, they can all attend the meetup. So Omprakash just added kind of the same information to eight meetup groups, and and you know, um, everybody can sign up with their own group without having to try to join a new group just to find more information. So. I will try to, I think when London had their virtual meetup, you know, Dresden mirrored that um, meetup information on their meetup, uh, meetup group as well. So that's something we can try to help each other during this time. And if uh, when we get the uh, Benelux um, workshop meetup going, then we can share that information with the other meetup groups and spread the word around as well. Yeah, it's interesting from my perspective as the stats person, right? That is an absolute nightmare to deal with. <laughs> because is that one meetup or is it seven? Yeah. <laughs> like, how do I do the stats for that? Right? It's, it's, it's pretty right. tricky. But that's um, why I said, like, like, if it's possible, if we, um, that there is a, the, um, a way to tell that it's a virtual meetup, then we can. That, that is going to get added. So the, the virtual or not is a flag in the meetup API. I need to go and add it to the library that pulls all of the stuff from, from meetups. Um, from Meetup's API so we can store that. So yes, you can do that. Um, my gut feeling is if it's got the virtual flag and it's on the same day and has the same title, 
it's probably the same thing, right? And so those would all get lumped together uh, as like a thing. If I'm going to do stats on like how many people came to meetups or whatever, um, then it's interesting to work out how to handle that kind of thing. But that's my problem, so don't worry too much about that. Um, <laughs> by all means, as Carol says, go and have virtual meetups. I'll figure that bit out myself. <laughs> um, so yeah. Uh, yeah, we'll definitely be able to know whether or not it's virtual um, soon, TM, uh, <laughs> as soon as I get around to, to hacking on that library again. Um, it's, it's fairly trivial to add. Um, so yeah, and I'll, I'll add that that as a column to this table as well so that you can see virtual meetups and then we'll do some we can do some interesting stats right we can do some more some more statistics on virtual versus non-virtual meetups um i don't know quite what questions we're going to ask of that data set yet but we'll see what we can do it might be might be might be fun you can see if like the average rsvp is higher or lower for virtual compared to normal be, it would be interesting um, i don't know if it means anything the problem with rsvps is they're completely meaningless right i mean greg's greg dex just said in in chat that like 50 percent of is actually quite good and i would agree with that in general but the problem is when you start looking through it it's like there's no rule of thumb right like 50 percent rs 50 percent from like pune versus which has got like 2,000 people in the meetup and yet 100 people actually rsvp and who knows how many people go right and then and then you flip that around and look at like a meetup that's only got 50 people on meetup but all of them rsvp and 70 percent of them turn up right and it's like there's just there's no rule of thumb to apply that works across all meetups there's just no way that you can have any kind of heuristic that stops us having to just go and ask maintainers how many people come up on a regular basis <laughs> it would be great if there was but there isn't yeah totally and different meet, different meetup groups have different uh kind of you know like in a big city you can't expect everyone you know two thousand people to to rsvp and join all at the same time and a small group uh in, in a smaller uh, region you know it's easier for them to get from point to point and and show up you know right uh, right right, right. Exactly. Well, it's, anyway, yeah. um, so <laughs> That's loads of stats and graphs and things. I would have shown you the real ones, but you know, browsers are apparently not behaving themselves. Um, <laughs> so um, if you want to see more, I'll I'll get some screenshots and post them into into RFC in a few minutes so that you can have a look at what the graphs really look like. Um, and I'll shut up now uh, because because um, I think gondolo has got some some more general thoughts about meetups that he wants to air. Um, so uh, yeah, I'll I'll go away. Uh, but if you want to talk to me, I'm on IRC. Uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts on on what stats might be interesting to you, um, or or where you know dashboards need to be expanded or, or whatever. So come talk to me. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, I, I think it's really interesting. I mean, one thing that's been great since Greg joined the team is that we've tried to replace the gut feel with some actual data. And if you go back and look at the recordings from uh, the previous contributors, some you can see there's been a lot of research done into the size of the repositories and the collections we should have. Does it make sense to have dumping grounds like Community General and our data in place? Yes, it probably does make sense. Um, I think, so if there's any other questions on that, um, throw them in into IRC. I think this is a nice segue into talking a bit about um, meetup structure how all things can be promoted and I, I think i will actually mention one of the points as well of um meetups are generally based on people being able to commute to a specific place but given the virtual covid world that we live in now what can we better do to to help and support people going forward so i'll, I'll hand over to carol thank you all right so i don't have any slides or anything uh... I'm just going to talk. Uh, yeah, so I think most people probably join some meetup.com group, I mean, Espo meetup.com uh, group. And, uh, you know, previously we had in person meetups and that's all great. But nowadays, actually, some, some groups might be starting physical meetups again soon. But, you know, I think for the most part, people still are hesitant about that and for good reason. So we are still trying to get more virtual meetups going. And uh, the good and bad thing about virtual meetups is, well, you can invite anybody to join because it's online and there's no physical traveling restrictions and things like that. But uh, the, the, 
it could be a, a negative thing as well because I, I noticed, for example, the India meetup. A lot of people just sign up and say yes, we're going, but they are the RSVP rate it tends a bit higher than normal. But the show the show rate, even though it's online, was actually a bit lower than what we have seen before. Like previously, maybe it's like forty percent of those who RSVP say yes, they will come and they show up. But now it's like thirty percent. So even though it's easier to join, but because you have so much going on, everything's online nowadays, you know, that that's also it's easy also not to take part. So so I think um in, instead of you know, because it takes it does take effort for people to organize and speakers to pr make pre prepare their presentations and everything. So it's probably a good idea to combine efforts with the different meetup groups, at least in a certain region, not across the world, but like uh, you know, APEC region, European region, and US, and so on, East Coast versus West Coast, and then you know have virtual meetups for for that region. So you know the Ben and Lux meetup, like we said, uh, when we have that uh, set up, we can share it with uh, you know the, those meetups in London, in Switzerland, in uh, France, and around uh, maybe even in, in Finland. And then we can, you know, all join the same meetup because at least with the time zone kind of work out. And also, you know, um, if possible to re have that recorded so we can share that um, afterwards after the meetup, um, which which actually I think in the next bullhorn I will share, for example, the, the India meetup, they have recordings and we will we'll share that. So um so yeah so if you have any questions about meetup feel free to contact me again cybat on rsc twitter arrow.chen at redhead.com um for swag i mean we still want to kind of have some incentive and some motivation for people to organize meetup and also speak at meetup so i am able to be able to ship some swag if you if you find speakers or if if you're yourself is interested in speaking, just talk to me. I'll be happy to provide some nice goodies um, for 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 you as well. So um, what else? Promotion. Um, again, uh, we are happy to share the information. Usually on Bullhorn, we'll have a list of upcoming meetups, so you can see um, what what's going on in your area. And also, if you have a meetup, if if you are already on on the list of meetups that we track, we should be able to see your meetup and then promote that on Bullhorn. Sometimes on Twitter, if you set, if you tweet about the meetup, we can retweet it and things like that. So, what else? Any questions? I think that's usually what I do for meetups. Help to promote it. Try to find speakers if you don't already have, and um, if possible, send you some swag and goodies. Right, let me check. Uh, see. <laughs> All right. Um, I guess back to you, Gondolo. Cool, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so what I'd be interested in in people's views, because we've got a good mix of people from across um, various continents here, is is do do city based meetups still make sense? Should we be picking uh, I don't know four to time zones and and promoting those somewhere and then let anyone from that's happy to present at that time, sort of get involved. Um, also really interested in if anyone's involved in different communities and seeing what's worked there or what people are experimenting with. Um, feel free to stick some stuff in the Blue Jeans chat or in ILC. Or just jump on the video.
Meetups are about content. Well, they're about they're about pizza and Coke and beer and getting together with people. But right now they're about none of those things. <laughs> um, because you can't do any of those things. So in the absence of those things, the only thing that a meetup can really be about is about interesting content. And getting together that content, uh, correlating that content, advertising that content, uh, feels less like an organic meetup thing and more of a traditional marketing thing. Uh, which worries me. And I don't know what to do about it. And I also worry that there's just a lot of virtual meetup fatigue. One of the reasons this event is useful is because we already have a, a cadence set for it. We already have an idea of what we want to accomplish. We got the buy-in of a bunch of people to make it happen and make it worthwhile. And figuring out how to do that with meetups on a smaller scale, I, I, I wish I had the answers yet, but I don't. Carol, you're on mute. Thank you. I have like the hardware mute and the software mute. <laughs> I always forget which one's on. Anyway, um, I think also, um, even though we, we start, yeah, like you said, a lot of it's about networking, being in person and making the connections and we lose quite a bit of that in virtual meetups. Um, even as we start, making things happen again physical space you know maybe that's places we can have social distancing uh venues and whatnot and people will start going cautiously to uh in-person meetups i think like for example at the london meetup there were people who say hey the virtual component was nice can we have that for future meetups like we, we, we probably at least for the you know near future half a year, one year, whatever, we we'll probably see a lot of these parallel meetups. Even we, if we start getting in um, physical meetups again, we can have like a blue jeans or Jitsi session, conferencing session uh, at the same time for those who want to participate virtually. Even if they're in the same town, they just don't want to be there in person and but just, you know, be online, which Hybrid meetups, I call them. <laughs> I think we'll see more of that. And 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 how do we make make that most efficient? Would we, we, we still want to do that for a, a region thing rather than just local? And because I, I know there are some meetups in Germany and Poland, for example, that they are in their local language, so they they probably want to keep it more or less local. Any considerations? Yeah, do you think it's time for, is it a good, good place for a break, perhaps? Sandler, what do you think? Oh, sorry, my audio cut out for a second then, Carol. Yeah. Gundala, do you think it's a good time for a break? Yeah, I, I think it does. And I, I'm wondering after the break if we're going to get a bit more audience participation and go for the voting of potential topics. Because um, I realise, for, you know, for, for a lot of people, they'll be going for three hours and, and maybe not hit the areas that they want to. Um, so in the Etherpad uh, online, starting line 75, I'll 
uh, increase the text size a bit there. We can sort of throw in what topics we'd like to cover um, for the remainder of the day. And then if we want to break out into separate groups and have a bit more um, audio discussion, um, that's something that we'd, we'd like to try a bit more this time. Yeah, um, 15 minutes, I guess, or so. All right, see you in 15 minutes.